in 1862. Within 10 years of Stuart's crossing, the March of Science had followed his track and traversed the centre of Australia. The Overland Telegraph Line was constructed between Darwin and Adelaide, bringing Australia into instant telegraphic communication with the rest of the world. It also established a chain of 11 manned repeater stations, a settled front line from which explorers could attack the last great mystery of the ancient continent. area of land west of the overland telegraph line to the Indian Ocean, almost a third of the continent, was still virtually unexplored, except for some forays on the western edge by the Gregory and Forrest brothers. The colonial governments and the private pastoralists who financed expeditions still hoped that a stock route to the west might be found through the interior of the continent, and even perhaps that good pasture land might be found on the way. For the explorers themselves, there was the incentive of fame and the chance of winning what looked to be the last great honour possible in Australian exploration, the honour of crossing the continent from the centre to the western coast. The first contestant for this honour came up the overland telegraph line and then struck west from this remarkable natural feature, Chambers Pillar, in August 1872. His name was Ernest Giles. Born in Bristol, England, Giles had come to Adelaide as a youth of 15 and spent years wandering restlessly round Australia. He'd established excellent credentials as a bushman. He burned to make important discoveries and he delighted in exploration for its own sake. Giles had no money, but with the help of the Victorian government botanist, Baron von Mueller, he was able to mount a modest expedition with two companions. My object is to force my way across the thousand miles that lay untrodden and unknown between the South Australian Telegraph Line and the settlements upon the Swan River. Leaving Chambers Pillar behind, the expedition followed the Valley of the Fink, the oldest river in the world. Giles reported that the natives called it Larapinta, or Snake, because of its tortuous wanderings. In the valley of this river, Giles discovered a remnant of the ancient semi-tropical world of the inland sea, a glade of Libestonia mariae palms. He named the remote and beautiful gorge the Glen of Palms. Giles trekked to the west until he was repelled by stony, waterless country at the Ehrenberg Range. 500 kilometres from the telegraph line. He turned south, but was again defeated in his attempt to travel west, this time by a vast salt lake. He could see a promising looking mountain on the other side, but his horses couldn't cross the salt pan. They broke through the crust and got bogged. He named the salt pan Lake Amadius, and the mountain, just visible in the distance, Mount Olga. Giles thought he could reach the mountain by veering even further south. But his two companions had had enough. They wanted to go home. Giles returned in disgust. He had battled the hostile elements. Above century temperatures, maddening bush flies, lacerating mulga scrub and spinifex, and the endless search for water. He had traversed a thousand miles of unknown country. Taken in a straight line, he would have reached the west coast. The impenetrable nature of the country had been a nasty shock to Giles, and he got another when he reached Charlotte Waters Telegraph Station. Here he met Colonel Warburton and Sons, with a strong expedition sponsored by two well-known South Australian capitalists, the Honourable Sir Thomas Elder and Captain Hughes. 
The leader, Colonel Peter Edgerton Warburton, was a retired South Australian police commissioner. At 60, he was unusually old for an explorer. But he was to prove himself as tough and as ruthless as that earlier military explorer, Major Mitchell. My biggest problem was the constant search for water. Giles generously showed the Warburtons his maps and told them that the only way through would have to be considerably north or south of the country that he'd attempted. He also learnt that a South Australian government expedition under the command of Mr William Goss was attempting the Western Crossing. Giles had no camels, but he knew they were the answer to crossing the waterless country. They could travel up to 17 days without water. Sir Thomas Elder, at his Beltana station, had formed Australia's first camel start. The Warburtons now had 17 of Elder's camels, with two Afghan drivers, and it was the first expedition to rely solely on camels for transport. The Warburton party of seven men was first away, leaving Alice Springs in April 1873. The leader of the other expedition, William Christie Goss of the South Australian Survey Department, had a strong and well-equipped party, but he was not the most adventurous of explorers. He produced valuable maps of the country he covered, but he liked to have some landmarks to steer by. And he began this expedition by following Warburton's tracks north along the Overland Telegraph Line. North of Alice Springs, Warburton eventually struck out northwest from the line, heading through unknown country towards the nearest known feature, Lake Gregory at the head of Sturts Creek. But Goss performed a great loop to the south crossed the track of Giles, pushed on below Lake Amadeus, and then southwest, heading for the Mount Olga, reported by Giles. On the way, he discovered the most stunning of all the natural features of Central Australia, a great red monolith, the peak of a buried mountain, 500 million years old. No white man ever discovered any lake or mountain or river in Australia which Aborigines hadn't found and named thousands of years earlier. The Aborigines called this Uluru, the Earth Mother, and it was a centre for their religious ceremonies. It was very bad form for an explorer to name something after himself, but he could repay his patrons and backers. And Goss immortalised the Premier of South Australia, Sir Henry Ayres, by naming this giant Ayres Rock. At the end of July, as Goss was camped at Ayres Rock, Giles was moving from the Overland Telegraph Line with his new expedition. William Teetkins was his second in command, a steady, reliable man who became Giles' most valued associate. Jimmy Andrews was a former sailor, and the fourth man, Alf Gibson, was a more unfortunate choice. A stockman recruited at the peak station. This time, Giles was determined not to have his crossing blocked by Lake Amadeus. So he took a more southerly route from the telegraph line towards the Musgrave Ranges. Then he headed for the natural feature which was always the object of his fascination, Mount Olga. But if he was pleased by the view, Giles was not pleased by what he saw on the ground. Here I perceived the marks of a wagon and horses and camel tracks. These I knew at once to be those of Goss's expedition. Goss had come down south through the regions and to the watering places which I discovered in my former journey. He had evidently gone south to the main range and I expected soon to overtake him. Thank you. 
Out on the great sandy desert, after more than three months and 2,000 kilometers of travel from Alice Springs, the Warburton expedition had degenerated into an endless search for water. Warburton adopted the practice of capturing and torturing Aborigines until they led him to water. On September the 4th, a howling, hideous old hag was captured. We secured the old witch by tying her thumbs behind her back and halting her by the neck to a tree. She kept up a frightful howling all night, during which time we had to watch her by turn or she'd have got away. And I don't think there's any way of securing these creatures if you take your eyes off them for ten minutes. Up! Up! Warburton complained that the blacks avoided him, but it was hardly surprising. His party and his camels would empty at one sitting wells which could support the natives of the great sandy desert for one year. Warburton was unlucky with his camels. Some ate poison bush, some just collapsed, and they were eaten. The camels were delicious. But every time they ate one, their travelling became that much harder. By mid-September, he had only nine camels to carry seven men and his stores. His flour was nearly gone. Most of his equipment was abandoned. His men were being eaten alive by ants whenever they lay down. The days were such a furnace of sun and sand that he could only travel by night and risk not seeing the wells. If we press on, we risk losing the camels and dying of thirst. If we stand still, we'll starve. <laughs> Far to the south, Goss had travelled through the Man Ranges and the Tompkinson Ranges over the West Australian border to the Kavanagh Ranges. Giles was now following his tracks, hoping to catch Goss and warn him off his territory. In early October, Giles arrived at what he called Fort Mueller in a rocky gully on the edge of the Cabana Ranges. Here again he saw Goss's tracks, but they were returning east and he was relieved to realise that his rival had given up and he was at last alone in the field. So far, Giles had had a good trip for an explorer, but the next three months seemed to justify Goss's caution in turning back. Giles tried every way he knew to push further west, but he couldn't advance his base camp beyond Fort Mueller. Anyone in future traversing these regions must be equipped entirely in leather. There must be leather shirts and leather trousers, leather hats, leather heads, and leather hearts. For nothing else can stand in a region such as this. 800 kilometers northwest of Giles, in the great sandy desert, Warburton was having even worse luck. Warburton was blind in one eye, and so weak now, that he couldn't walk at all and travelled strapped on the back of a camel. What a country. Did ever man before traverse such a tract of desert? I think not. In early December, the party reached the Okova River, where they had plenty of water at last, but no food. On December the 13th, Warburton sent two of the strongest men, Lewis and the Afghan Halim, to get help from the nearest station, wherever it might be. With them was a letter to be delivered to his patron, Thomas Elder, saying they were all alive, and that was all. <laughs> 
The nearest station, De Grey, was 270 kilometres away, much further than Warburton thought. After a week of agonised waiting, the five survivors on the Okova had killed and eaten their last camel. Warburton included in his journal a recipe for cooking every part of a camel. The head, the tail, the feet, the bones, the guts, even the hide. The tough hide was cut up and parboiled. The coarse hair was then scraped off with a knife and the leather-like substance returned to the pot and stewed till it was like the inside of a carpenter's glue pot, both to the smell and to the taste. Nourishment there was little or none, but it served to fill up space, and as such was valuable to starving men who could afford to discard nothing. On Christmas Day, 1873, with Lewis and Halim still not returned, the Warburton party dined on their last shreds of camel and a captured bird. Starving and sweltering in the December desert heat, all they could do was draw a mental picture of their friends in Adelaide, sitting down to their Christmas dinner. Down at Fort Mueller, the Giles party, having just driven off a native attack by gunfire, was enjoying a slightly more salubrious Christmas. No sign of natives, Mr. Teakins, I hope. No, Mr. Giles, we don't need Gibson shot a wallaby, and we had fried chops for our Christmas dinner. We drew from the medical department a <clears throat> bottle of rum to celebrate Christmas and victory. We perhaps had no occasion to envy anyone their Christmas dinner, although perhaps we did. Gentlemen, I give you victory and a Merry Christmas. Here's the victory. Here's, Here's the Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes. Yes. Ah, a well mature well drop. Yes, yes, very, very good. At this stage, Giles' situation seemed much more fortunate than Warburton's. But four days later, Warburton was rescued taken to Roeburn on the west coast and hailed as the winner of the race across the desert. Meanwhile, Giles remained stuck for many weeks in his camp at Fort Mueller, making unsuccessful attempts to push further west. Eventually, he moved north to the Rawlinson Ranges and waited for rain, but with no luck. Giles decided to try what impression a trip of 100 miles would make on the country to the west. He wanted to take the experienced Teetkins, but Gibson begged to be his companion. So, with two pack horses carrying food and water, they rode away. The journey through waterless country of sand hills and stone was very hard going. After one day, Giles sent the two pack horses back to their camp to save having to water them. He left two five gallon kegs of water hanging in a tree along the track. On the second day, when they'd traveled more than 160 kilometers and were in sight of some hills Giles called the Alfred and Mari range, Gibson's horse collapsed and died on the spot. They started back, taking turns to ride the remaining horse. OK, Gibson, we are in a most terrible fix with only one horse. Only one can ride, and one must remain behind. I shall remain. And now listen to me. Rouse Mr. Teakins, get fresh horses and more water bags, and return as soon as you possibly can. I depend upon you to bring me relief. Oh, Giles started immediately to walk after Gibson. He walked through the hot afternoon and most of the night. And in the middle of the next day, he reached the kegs after walking 50 kilometers without a drink. <laughs> 
He found that Gibson had left him two gallons of water and one pound of smoked horse meat. Giles was still 130 kilometres from the base camp and he thought that if he had to wait for help to arrive, he would die. He decided to walk, carrying the keg of water on his back. I started, bent double by the keg, and could only travel so slowly that I thought it scarcely worthwhile to travel at all. I became so thirsty at every step I took that I longed to drink up every drop of water I had in the keg. But it was the elixir of death I was burdened with, and to drink it was to die. Giles staggered on through the desert, often collapsing and in a state of nightmare, with little idea of the passing of time. On about the third day, he saw that the pack horses returning to the base camp had for some reason left their original track to the east and had turned further south. He was appalled to see that Gibson had followed them. I felt sure Gibson would soon find his error and return to the main line. I was unable to investigate this any farther in my present position. I followed them about a mile and then returned to the proper line, anxiously looking at every step to see if Gibson's horse tracks returned into them. They never did. Giles finished the keg of water and threw it away on the 29th of May. He'd now been walking for seven days since he parted from Gibson. On the eighth day, he reached a spring called the Circus and found water at last, and even food. Oh, how I drank, how I reeled. How hungry I was. I saw a small, dying wallaby. Like an eagle, I pounced on it and ate it. Living, raw, dying. Fur, skin, bones, skull, and all. The delicious taste of that creature I shall never forget. At daybreak the next day, Giles staggered into the base camp at Fort McKellar. He learnt from Teetkins that Gibson had not reached the camp and that none of the horses had returned. In spite of the incredible demands that he'd made on his own frame, Giles rested just one day before he was back on horseback looking for Gibson. He and Tietkin searched for a week, but without success. They found that the tracks of Gibson's horse had turned even further south into the desert, and they could not follow. We had to abandon any further attempt. I call this terrible region Gibson's Desert, after this first white victim to its horrors. This death ended the expedition and Giles retreated to the Overland Telegraph Line at Charlotte Waters. It was a year since he'd left the line, and in spite of quite remarkable persistence, he'd again failed to cross the desert. Now he learnt that Warburton had already won the race and been awarded the gold medal of the Royal Society. And yet another rival, John Forrest from Perth, was now in the desert and attempting the first crossing from the west coast back to the overland telegraph line. Forrest, a first-class explorer, left Perth for Geraldton with five experienced men and 21 horses. Working his way up the Murchison River, he then turned east 
and entered the terrible Spinifex country of the Gibson Desert. In June 1874, Forrest camped at Weld Springs, was attacked by 50 natives and drove them off by rifle fire. The natives attacked because Forrest occupied their waterhole. But Forrest couldn't move from Weld Springs. Luck is an element at least as valuable to the explorer as skill. And Forrest now enjoyed the luck which had eluded Goss and Giles. Rain, so rare in that country, fell ahead of his track and filled the rock holes and the clay pans with water. In the middle of August, Forrest reached Giles' old camp at Fort Mueller, and he was able to see from the tracks that Giles and Goss had passed within a few miles of each other without meeting. With the help of Goss's maps, Forrest was now able to proceed east along known water holes. And on September the 27th, he reached the Overland Telegraph Line and was acclaimed a public hero. Later, Forrest was knighted and became a leading politician. Giles had once again been overshadowed, but he would never give up. In 1875, supplied by Sir Thomas Elder at last with the camels he'd always wanted, Giles made a risky dash across the Great Victoria Desert and finally reached Perth. After a tumultuous welcome and after drinking Perth dry of champagne, he turned the expedition around and recrossed from the west to the telegraph line in another extraordinary journey. There was little reward for the years that Giles spent in exploration, and he died a humble death in Kilgardie. But in his book, he made it clear that he would do it all again. I have called my book The Romance of Exploration. An explorer is an explorer from love, and it is nature, not art, that makes him so. The history of Australian exploration, though not yet quite complete, is now so far advanced towards its end that only minor details now are wanting to fill the volume up. And though I shall not attempt to rank myself amongst the first or greatest, Yet, I think I have reason to call myself the last of the Australian explorers. In less than a century, the explorers had filled in the great blanks on the map of Australia. They were a mixed bunch, and they did it for mixed motives, but they were all in their way adventurers. And perhaps Giles spoke for them all when he said that the marvelous thing about Australia was that there was room Room not just for snowy mountains and ancient rivers and great rocks, but room for rovers like him. Few of the explorers stopped to think that there should be room also for an older Australian race with ancient claims on this continent. Most of them thought the land was just there for the taking. If the ghosts of the old explorers returned today, they'd find much of Australia changed beyond recognition but they'd also find some of the land that was not for the taking, some that remains unconquered. Whatever the nature of the country, they risked their lives to make it known. And their true monument is the map of Australia and their names that are on it. That was the final program of the Explorers. Tomorrow at 11.30...